My name is Martha Hall Finley. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at Suncor, um, which is kind of an interesting challenge because we are an oil sands company. We're a lot more than that, but you know, I do. I do, I do encourage people to say, so yeah, Chief Sustainability Officer, Oil Sands Company, how does that work? Anyway, it prompts some really good discussion. You might have heard the expression, there are two sure things in life, death and taxes. But tax law is about a lot more than that. This podcast from the University of Ottawa Tax Law Society has two goals, to help students find careers in tax and to ask questions about the hidden side of tax from cryptocurrencies and AI to the Pandora Papers, from funding universal minimum incomes to even what tax has to do with your favorite streaming service. As a former journalist and a first year law student, I don't know much about tax law yet, but I do like when cities are clean and people are healthy, which are two places where tax money goes. This show is for beginners like me and experts like my guests who have some answers. Because if there are only two sure things in life, let's at least make sure the tax part is interesting. Martha Hall Findlay is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Suncor Energy, which includes Petro-Canada. She and her teams are responsible for Suncor's sustainability actions and disclosures, but also its internal and external communications, government relations, and Indigenous and community relations, which I'd imagine is hard enough for any company, but especially so for an energy company when climate change is on everyone's minds. She started in a very different industry, however, putting her law degree to work for major corporations in Canada and abroad before moving into politics, public policy, and now back to corporate work at Suncor. But her CV demonstrates her drive to succeed in everything she does. And it started early. I hope she won't be offended by this, but I'd say she's a classic overachiever. From being a silver medalist at the 1976 Canadian Alpine Ski Championships to serving on various boards for nonprofit organizations to giving up corporate law to serve Canadians in Parliament. Here's Martha Hall Finley. The conversation today is about tax. And, you know, little known fact when I went to law school, I took every tax course I could. It was so interesting. So domestic tax, international tax, um, and a little anecdote, I did not have the uh, benefit of having a constitutional law course with Peter Hogg, but one of my tax courses was in fact um, with Peter Hogg. So for, for most people younger than I am, you know, you'd only know Peter Hogg's name from, from some of the best law books ever but he was amazing so maybe maybe partly because he was so good that encouraged me to to do another tax course who knows so you went to osgood hall at york university as you mentioned and graduated in 1987 i believe what attracted you to tax law initially um it, it's a great question because when i i, I had not, i had never planned to go to law school um, but when I finished my degree, I was finishing, you know, in the process of finishing my degree in international relations, I think, well, what am I going to do with this? And, and law school beckoned, you know, I got in, I was accepted. And so there you go. And then, you know, I, was, I thought, well, this will be really interesting. It might be a way to, to work on my international interests. Um, but when I got to law school and, and saw the opportunities, and Osgood has a, a really broad, because it's such a big school, it actually can offer a pretty broad curriculum. So there was a lot on offer. And I took one tax course just because, you know, I was interested in business. You need, you need to, you know, you need to have the basics. And it was so much fun because it, it just was like doing a puzzle, right? We do puzzles in our spare time, whether they're jigsaw or Sudoku's or whatever, right? Else that's <laughs> exactly. Um, oh my, that brought back memories. Um, <laughs> but but it was just intellectually really, it was fun. It was challenging. It was just, okay, what the hell's a butterfly transaction? How, how does that work, right? And so you just die. I, I found diving into it and trying to figure things out was really fun. And <coughs> sorry. And so that, that went into, okay, the next course and international tax. And then you had do international tax and then it's, it's, you know, a set of puzzles uh, exponentially, um, expanded. So it just was really intellectually challenging and, and I, and I found it really fun. Then why didn't you pursue it upon graduation? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, 
I actually thought about it. I mean, when I when I articled at Baker McKenzie, which is where I, I, I it was really the only firm in town that at that time, believe me, I know it's much different now, but at that time it was the only firm that was really doing a fair bit of international business work because of the international network. So I I, I, I articled and then and then worked at Baker McKenzie. And and <clears throat> Baker McKenzie actually did a lot of tax work. Um, Skip, Skip Siegel and Bert Stitt were, were primarily tax lawyers. And so there's a lot of tax work. Um, but one, I, I found that an awful lot of the work in tax, especially international tax, was driven not by how to make better products, do better services, you know, manufacture things. It was really driven to maximizing, you know, how little money you needed to pay in tax. Mm -hmm. Um, So part of me is a Canadian. Um, I'm a big believer in taxation. I mean, of course, you know, you're, you're, you're crazy if you pay more than you should. The law is the law is the law. And if, and, and what's legal is, isn't, is fair game. But I just found I kind of just on a social uh, policy perspective, I found that a bit challenging. I, I didn't embrace it as much as I embraced the, the challenge of the intellectual puzzles. Um, the other piece was I found, and this might not be fair, but I found that the, the folks in, who were practicing tax tended to kind of not be the outward social, you know, they tended to be in their offices and research and doing the puzzles right um but but i just wanted to i was really interested in the larger business i was really interested in how it all fit together i was really interested in you know how the marketing fit with the hr and how that all fit with uh met the manufacturing piece or the you know all all of the bits depending on the industry and so i really found myself much more drawn to the to, to the broader corporate commercial approach um the, and and in the day in that those years when i was doing that very heavy on mergers and acquisitions so so i i ended up defaulting to the larger, more generalist approach. And, and, I, and I love that too. You specialized in corporate, commercial, and international law before going in council for BCE, what more people probably think of as Bell Canada today. Well, Bell, Bell Mobility. Bell Mobility. Business. Right, because you specialize in mobility. Yeah, no, at the time, Bell Mobility thought that BCE was, BC was the, you know, Bell Canada, the big gold corporate bureaucratic thing. <laughs> Bell Mobility, when I started, we were still young. We were still dealing with cell phones that were the size of a shoebox. And it cost, you know, a couple of grand to install one in your phone, in your car, rather. So, yeah. But, and you're, you then worked as general counsel in corporate development for Rider Group. So another uh, another huge corporation, a travel company in 1995, yes? Uh, and then on to the Czech Republic. And you came back to mobility jobs in Canada. So all staying in, in corporate uh, before successfully running for a seat in parliament in 2008. Um, how did law and corporate prepare you for political um, a political career? Oh, gosh. You know, I, I spend a fair bit of time. I get lots of folks asking, you know, whether it's mentorship or just advice, you know, young people saying, oh, gee, I'm not, should I go to law school? What do you think? And which I love, by the way, I love, you know, hey, you know, do you have time for a cup of coffee? And I say, yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> without fail, I, I say for anybody who's interested in going to law school, I, my answer is I have never met anybody who regrets having gone to law school ever. It serves such great purpose no matter what you do. Even if it were just the training in analysis, the importance of facts, the importance of you need to actually be, be objective to be able to know the facts so that then you can put forth better arguments. I mean, that said, I remember doing the moot um, and and having a completely, you know, one view of, of a particular situation. And then somebody asked, somebody's partner um, got sick and asked if I would do their moot with them too, but it was on the other side of the question. <coughs> it was amazing how you could, 
you know, use the, 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 the analysis to, um, to, to put forth different arguments. That in itself was a really big learning. But in my entire career, what I learned at law school, what I learned practicing law on Bay Street for a few years was also really, really valuable. That client interaction, um, interaction with, with fellow colleagues, um, I, I just, I, I, you know, the, 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 it doesn't get talked a lot about, but one of the things that I found in my practice that was really important for everything else I've done is when you're in private practice, you always have that concern of you're going to get sued or, you, you know, there, there are significant issues if you screw up. And that's a real, uh, there's a, there's a real incentive there to to do good work. There's a real incentive to make sure that you know what you're talking about, that you do have the facts, that you have pulled together strong analysis. So I, I really learned a lot, man. I, I, I learned so much in my, in my years of practice as well as my years at law school. That, that helps in everything you do. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's not just the obvious of if I'm, if I'm in, a, in a business and we're talking about a potential acquisition, I know what the lawyers are talking about, right? I have a pretty good idea when we're talking about, because I, I, I ended up doing much more on the business side than the legal side in my, in my business career. But, you know, you said talking about the strategic value of a particular acquisition, you have a lot more just, you know what the questions are that you should be asking. You might not know. Um, but it's really helpful to know what the questions are. <coughs> Doesn't take away from the importance of having the lawyers who are actually up to speed in terms of practice. But I found it really, really useful. Um, even, even you know, when I was talking a little bit about the um, how how to encourage and support a federal government approach to investment tax credits. You know, I can look and, and look at the U.S. 45Q regime and I understand it, right? That in and of itself is really valuable. And I understand what the constraints are on our federal government because our, our tax regimes are somewhat different. And, the, and then you have the whole, you know, federal versus provincial talking about carbon tax. And, you know, as, as, as you would know, that has been a bit of a sensitive issue across the country. And, you know, coordinating what happens at a federal level with different provincial approaches. All of that stuff is is so much easier for me to understand and grasp and work with because of that past experience. No question also as a politician, it's really helpful to understand this stuff. Well, you, you talked about tax and how the kind of human side of, of tax policy is important to you and, and how people should be paying their fair share of tax. Uh, after your political career, you uh, went into public policy. You went back to school, the Rotman School of Management at U of T. Um, so I'm wondering why that transition into uh, policy after your political career, if that had to do, I could be pulling at strings here, but if that had to do with uh, wanting to make, continue to make a, a, a social impact in, in Canada and your beliefs. And then also, I know you're not supposed to combine questions. That's also something we learn in law school, but I want to make sure I get it in before I forget it. Um, you, uh, do you think that there is another tax incentive or policy that uh, if you still had your policy hat on right now that you would like to see the federal government or provincial governments implement? Uh, okay, so the first question, um, I, I didn't actually go back to Rotman for an MBA. I actually did my Institute of Corporate Directors. So I did the ICD course, which is also really good. Um, I'd done sort of part of the MBA at, at, at York when I was doing my, my law degree. It was before there was a joint um, LLB MBA. So I took a few of the MBA courses just because, um, but I, I, I did that because I was interested in the role of boards of directors, frankly, in, in running businesses, but very much on the policy side. And then I did run the Canada West foundation, which is, you know, one of Canada's, uh, made major think tanks. And, you know, I think I got into politics because I was interested in policy, right? So I've been interested in policy my whole life. So these were opportunities to kind of stay in that in that area of interest. Um, there's no there's no question that tax. Sometimes people rely too much on tax. So when I was a politician, I remember very vividly somebody saying, "Well, we should." 
you know, we should get rid of the, the GST on bicycle pur purchases, you know, and I, and, and I'm a big fan of bikes, big fan of encouraging bike lanes, all that kind of stuff. But my answer was, no, I'm not going to support that because frankly, the tax system is already complicated enough. If you really want to incent people to buy bikes, probably better to actually build more bike lanes. Um, but taking away the GST uh, is, you know, it's, it sounds good. It's politically right, but the actual effect is is going to be minimal, and it'll just complicate things. So, so I caution people about using tax. I have cautioned people about using tax for political ends, as opposed to just let's get stuff done. Um, I do think you know my example of investment tax credits to encourage the building of emissions reduction infrastructure, uh, and and encourage the establishment and commercialization of of uh, emission reduction technologies, clean tech, fantastic. Um, I also really think it's important for policies like um, universal uh, daycare and early learning. Uh, that's something that the current government is doing, better late than never. Um, some of us have been advocating that for decades. Um, but where you can use tax policy to incent or make some of that more available to people, I think that's the kind of thing that, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very keen on economic and social prosperity. And um, there's no question taxation and tax policy has a role to play, significant role to play. Uh, I, I know we're running out of time, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about policy because uh, we talk about it in law school. We, we talk about it outside of law school and how important uh, research that goes into policy making is. But I don't know if it's just me or if everybody else has an understanding of how policy goes from research to implementation. Um, so I'm wondering if you can tell me exactly what happens with the research that poli policy researchers such as yourself did or well, do now, but you did. Sometimes it ends up collecting dust on a shelf and that doesn't have any effect, right? Um, so the one thing I, I, one thing I would caution about research, I have over the last couple of decades found research, frankly, to be less objective. And I get shocked occasionally when I see research done that, that, that it's, you know, instead of decision, uh, evidence-based decision-making, there's way too much um, decision-based evidence making. And so I do caution research has to, to be valid and valuable and helpful. Research has to be objective. You may find out stuff you don't like. Well, too bad, so sad. That's, if, that's the, if those are the facts, any research and any recommendations in terms of policy won't be valid if, if you're not being really transparent and and honest about the facts you might get a little bit of the way you know campaigning but um but in the long run no um the other thing that i find is that uh you can have some amazing research but if it's not translated into really clear and based on this research we recommend a b c in really clear language and to be able to say, and this is what will happen, then the research will get lost, right? So it's turning, it's, turn, it's that step that often gets missed of turning research, which could be amazing work, but it, it often doesn't get translated into action because um, the language, the, 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 the complexity hasn't been translated into um, the the easier i shouldn't say easier that's unfair but but politicians need to sell what they're doing right so so they need to be able to translate that work into so therefore we're recommending this um they're not always good at that so the people doing the research i think would do well to to figure out how to actually translate the research into practical recommendations themselves and also probably disseminate that uh, how to how to actually get it into people's hands is an issue. Like if you're are you handing a, a memo to a politician or to an advisor or are you putting it in a newspaper, for example? Exactly. And there are a variety of different ways. Um, you know, dig, digital has allowed incredibly easy dissemination, but it's also incredibly crowded because of the ease of dissemination. And so people have to be 
it's a lot harder to find really good objective stuff online now because you just there's so much crap out there but um but yeah that that that's an issue both for those who want to disseminate and those who actually want to be able to find good information I feel like we could talk about that with um you know a, a lot of what you 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 do at, at Suncor I mean you know we're an energy company right it, it's science it's geology it's it's physics it's you know you can't you can't you can't run a, an effective uh process or, or or set of processes like this we're a mining company we you know offshore offshore um drilling like these are really complicated things you you, you have to have really strong engineering you have to have really strong science but then when it comes to climate, you have to have really good objective um, science and information about greenhouse gas emissions. You can't have, you know, oh, well, you know, this this is a, um, what's a good example of, I uh, just one I, I was looking at the other day, you know, uh, methane emissions from cows. And will a certain type of seaweed, if it's mixed in with their feed, um, significantly reduce methane emissions? Well, I see all sorts of stuff that claims it, but there's an awful lot of stuff out there that if you if you don't dig in, you might, oh, isn't that awesome? And let's invest in that. Um, or if you're a policymaker, let's provide tax incentives to encourage that. Right. Um, but if if the science isn't there, if it's not factually supported, then it's a problem. And so we really, I find we really need to work hard to make sure that we have um, the really solid objective scientific backup before you can make any of these decisions. But frankly, that's true for everything that we do. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Well, uh, thank you. I, I was so tickled when when I when when you contacted and said, do you want to talk about tax and you know law school? I thought, oh, yes, that'd be fun. Thanks for listening to the Tax Law Society podcast from the University of Ottawa. Today's show was produced and edited by me, Amy Watson, with research and graphic support from Adriana Conti and Arjun Gupta, and audio engineering support from Max Desmarais of Mix by Max. The Tax Law Society is committed to helping law students find jobs and build careers in tax law. If you want to learn more, check out our website at www.taxlawottawa.ca. So the question is the role that tax and tax uh, policy tax law plays in what is increasingly um, a, a sustainable finance drive globally. Um, it is it is kind of cool that Mark Carney, our Canadian, um, has been driving this effort. Certainly, the, the sustainable finance piece. Um, you know, I work in the energy industry. I work in the oil industry. Sometimes we get a bit challenged with um, some of the you know the further extreme. We'll just divest, you know, shut it all in. Uh, that's a longer discussion and I'll, you know, I could explain why that actually is counterproductive, but, and I don't say that because I'm in the industry, I've been saying that for years as a Canadian. But um, regardless of, of where your financing comes from, almost every time um, an investor is still looking for a financial return. People are not in this business for philanthropic reasons. So you, you talk about sustainable finance, you talk about regular finance, whatever, people are still looking for a return. But a return can vary depending on how it's taxed. And so tax policy can actually make um, the return on a portfolio more attractive, even at lower, otherwise what would be lower interest rates or lower uh, overall returns. There's no question, there are a whole variety of levers that the tax world tax policy can play. Um, one really good example that we deal with every day in, 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 in our indus, industry at Suncor and the oil sands, um, we at Suncor um, combined with the other major oil sands companies and announced what we call the, path, the oil sands pathways to net zero alliance. Uh, we announced it in June. Our goal is we're 95% of the oil sands production, so pretty much the oil sands. And we've we've said we, we plan to be um, net zero by 2050 in our production. Well, I got to tell you, we're not a retail chain. We're not a software company. We're oil sands. So to get to net zero by 2050, that's going to be huge because the oil sands alone represent 10% of all of Canada's emissions. We're a big part of the challenge here. So we we recognized years ago, we had to be able to be a big part of the solution. So fast forward to last June, and this is what we've announced. 
there is no question we can't do this alone. We have to do it in collaboration with, with governments, federal and provincial. And after significant um, uh, effort working in particular with the federal government, the, the budget last year in 2021, the federal budget in the spring of 2021 specifically included the concept of investment tax credits that would be available for things like carbon capture and storage. In the United States, the corollary, also tax policy and tax law, is what is referred to as the 45Q. Um, you, you know, look up 45Q and you'll get a whole bunch of stuff on U.S. tax um, policy. And um, the reason that's important is that um, it has in, it has encouraged. Oops, sorry. He really loves that tax. Is not too. my dog opining on 45Q. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> She's very pro 45. <laughs> She's very, very, very pro. What we see in the United States, the investment tax credit announcement by the federal government really came about because we were watching what was happening in the United States, tax policy in the United States being very important to encourage the building of, for example, carbon capture and storage. There are lots of other tax incentives for other clean tech and other approaches, but I'm, I'm just focusing on carbon capture and storage right now, just for example purposes. Um, so the 45Q regime in the United States is uh, has been instrumental in getting significant CC and C CCS and CCUS carbon capture use and storage projects uh, off the ground. Um, so the federal government in Canada said, oh, well, we need to come up with something different. Our tax regime is, is different enough that we couldn't just replicate the 45Q, but, um, but we now have this concept of the investment tax. I mean, it's not a new concept, but the ability for the federal government to say, we're going to use the, the concept of investment tax credits to encourage um, certain behaviors that will reduce significantly reduce emissions. So uh, we're very excited about that. You know, we're still figuring out what what the numbers are. You know, what are the percentages? But um, it not only is it a great example of how tax policy, tax legislation can um, be really effective to accomplish some really important societal things. Um, it's also an example of government and industry collaboration which I also think is really, really um, important. Uh, I'm, I'm, I joined the company partly because I'm we're so proud of the, the work that Suncor has done over decades, in fact, on, on uh, so many areas of sustainability, including emissions reductions. And we have a long way to go in emissions reductions, but that's not why we're having a conversation here today. It's about tax. 